Oh, hi. You caught me hiding under the docks. Speaking of being a recluse, let's talk about Steve Ditko. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. This past week, Steve Ditko passed away at the age of 89. He'll always be remembered for his distinctive artistic style and his many creations and co-creations from Hawk and Dove to The Creeper, The Question, Mr. A, Doctor Strange, and of course, Spider-Man. He's often been referred to as a bit of a recluse, and while there's some truth to that, I think that if we look at his entire career through the lens of his personal philosophies, it makes a little bit more sense why he'd leave so many high-profile jobs. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at some of the essays and rare interviews that Steve Ditko has given, as well as hear actual audio from the man himself describing his work. After graduating high school and just a week before his 18th birthday, Ditko enlisted in the U.S. Army and served in post-war Germany starting in late 1945. He illustrated comics for the Army newspaper in Europe, and after his discharge, he studied at the Cartoonists and Illustrators School of New York City under Jerry Robinson, the successful Batman artist. He used his GI Bill to move to New York and study there for two years beginning in 1950 and began working professionally in 1953 with stories published in Fantastic Fears No. 5 and Daring Love No. 1. He began working as an inker in Jack Kirby and Joe Simon's studio in 1953 and began doing work for Atlas Comics, which eventually became Marvel Comics, and also Charlton Comics. It was around this time that Ditko became an ardent follower of writer Ayn Rand's new philosophy that she named Objectivism. Rand began to explore this set of beliefs in her fictional novels like 1943's The Fountainhead and 1957's Atlas Shrugged, and then began following it up with various essays. At its core, objectivism argues that the purpose of one's life is the pursuit of one's own happiness, which Rand referred to as rational self-interest. At the end of the day, individual rights trump all. Art's place within the worldview of objectivism is to transform metaphysical ideas into physical, understandable form. To this end, Steve Dicko insisted that his work should speak for itself, and generally refused most interview requests. Ayn Rand's philosophy was a direct response to Romanticism, which was a popular philosophy at the time. Romanticism would argue that truth can be subjective and found by exploring our emotions. Rand said that truths exist objectively, no matter how someone felt about it. She wrote, quote, My philosophy, in essence, is the concept of man as a heroic being, with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. Rand had a formula for this. She liked to say, A is A. Essentially, this meant that a fully realized hero had no room for moral equivocation. He knew right from wrong and refused to allow evil to exist or even to allow others to stand by to allow evil to exist. Ditko's most fully realized creations to live by these principles were created around this time in 1967. His own character, Mr. A, which we'll come back to, and The Question for Charlton Comics. Both were reporters who put on a simple mask and suit and would not change at all for the world around them. DC Comics later bought Charlton's characters, and the question would eventually appear in an episode of Justice League Unlimited, where the writers actually had him espouse this theory. What are you babbling about? Everything that exists has a specific nature. Each entity exists as something in particular and has characteristics that are part of what it is. A? Eh? is A. And no matter what reality he calls home, Luthor is Luthor. Steve Dicko believed that you were either good or evil, and he refused to portray morally confused characters heroically. He excused Spider-Man because he was young and still learning. Otherwise, he had great disdain for characters that could be said to have feet of clay. 
Since the days of Greek tragedies, writers have found that the most interesting stories have characters with flaws so that they can go on a journey where they learn and improve. Generally, the least compromising characters in superhero comics are the villains, who have a central goal like stealing money or power. Ditko's stories are much different, especially when he would later co-write his own stories. His heroes don't change at all. The world around them does. Alan Moore later commented on this when he created Rorschach in The Watchmen, based strongly on the question. Ditko co-created Spider-Man with Stan Lee in 1962, after Lee first asked Jack Kirby to come up with some sketches for his idea, but they looked too much like Captain America. No one drew Spider-Man quite like Steve Ditko. He moved in a certain way. He had those utterly unique eyes and a costume designed head to toe unlike anything else in comics at the time. The power of the panels showing Spider-Man's struggle to escape this collapsed machinery is arguably the most iconic Spider-Man scene of all time. If you ever want to experience everything great about Spider-Man, it's all found in those first three years that Lee and Ditko worked together on the character. At the same time, Ditko created Doctor Strange and would plot and illustrate one of the most visually exciting characters in comics. His artwork is surreal and psychedelic, yet Ditko didn't use any hallucinogenics or other drugs. Then, in 1966, Ditko suddenly quit working at Marvel without explanation, while Spider-Man was an incredibly popular title. Or at least, that's what most people think. Stan Lee has said that it's because he and Ditko disagreed over the reveal of Green Goblin as an established supporting character, Norman Osborn. And if we view that through the lens of objectivism, that almost makes sense. Norman is a self-made man, an industrialist, who could be seen to be a hero. But that's just not the case. Ditko actually has explained what happened in the form of essays in his self-published comics. But because he doesn't go to conventions or grant interviews, many people aren't aware of this. But Ditko says he was never surprised at the Norman Osborn plan. He explains he even inserted Norman in earlier issues at a social club with newspaper publisher J. Jonah Jameson and at Spider-Man's friend Harry Osborn's college scenes. This was done so that the reveal would later have more impact on the supporting cast. Instead, Ditko says he was simply not getting along with Lee. The two men had very different ideas on how to portray heroes. Ditko would illustrate pages with Peter Parker being annoyed at protesters, but Lee would script it to be no big deal, for instance. The real reason that Stan Lee and Steve Ditko stopped getting along was probably that Steve got tired of Stan not giving him his proper credit. After two years of working on Spider-Man, Ditko demanded a co-writer credit since he was actually plotting the entire issues. Stan was allegedly pretty angry, but he did grant plot credit to Steve Ditko. But Stan began taking shots at Steve in the media. In a 1965 interview with the New York Herald Tribune, Stan said, Ditko thinks he's the genius of the world. Stan even openly mocked Ditko's first credited issue, writing this, Spider-Man number 18 features a different type, and aren't they all entitled The End of Spider-Man? A lot of readers are sure to hate it, so if you want to know what all the criticism is about, be sure to buy a copy. How's that for a left-handed sell? What criticism? The issue wasn't even out yet. There are alleged stories of other comic creators visiting Steve Ditko at his studio in Manhattan and finding stacks of uncashed checks from Marvel Comics. To Steve, it was either full credit for what he did or nothing at all. They stopped communicating directly. One day, Ditko came to the Marvel offices to tell Stan he was quitting. Production manager Saul Brodsky was acting as their go-between and went to tell Stan, but according to Ditko, Stan wouldn't come out of his office, so he refused to understand why Ditko decided to quit. From Steve's point of view, there was no such thing as compromise. If he wasn't able to put forward his objectivist philosophy in his work, the moral thing to do was to leave. According to objectivism, you don't have to win a fight, but you must stand by your convictions at all times. Ditko went to Charlton Comics, where he had briefly worked in 1960, creating the first version of Captain Atom. He created the second Blue Beetle, Ted Kord, an industrialist and inventor, in late 1966. He then created one of his most personal creations, The Question. 
In later essays, Ditko says he wanted to make his eventual creation Mr. A, but figured to do that character right, it wouldn't pass the comic's code. So he created a similar but tamer version in the question. Very shortly later, he debuted his creation Mr. A as a story in Wally Wood's underground comic Wit's End No. 3. He would continue to tell stories with Mr. A over the years. The last completed story was as recent as 2016 and is the clearest view of his beliefs. Most of these stories were published by his friend Robin Snyder, who was an editor Ditko worked with at both Archie Comics and Charlton. Charlton's freedom was great, but the pay was low. So Ditko went over to DC Comics and did a bunch of work there under editor Dick Giordano. In 1968, he created both The Creeper and Hawk and Dove. He didn't last long. The Creeper debuted in April of 1968 in Showcase No. 73, followed by his own ongoing series, Beware the Creeper, that Ditko illustrated five issues of. At about the same time, he did two issues of Hawk and Dove. But Ditko didn't like Hawk and Dove writer Steve Skeet's ideas for the characters, and editor Dick Giordano seemed to side with Skeet's, so Ditko again suddenly quit with half of issue six of Creeper done, but he's not credited, and even fans and experts aren't sure if any of Ditko's work made it into the issue. It may have been done by Neil Adams trying to mimic his style. Hawk and Dove were brothers with opposite ideas of philosophy, playing off the politics of the late 60s. Hawk was tough and aggressive, and Dove more passive and an intellectual. You'd think this might lend itself to a situation where there's the brains of the team and the brute force. Instead, according to Ditko's beliefs, he illustrated Hawk as ready for action and full of conviction, and drew Dove more effeminate and weak. Skeets' scripts didn't match with Ditko's ideals, so he left DC and began working on stories himself, with the most regular being more adventures for Mr. A. Mr. A fit Ditko's worldview best. He was a reporter, searching for the objective truth. He would come across criminals of many different types and leave them with his calling card, one side white and one side black. To both Ditko and Mr. A, you were one or the other, because there could be no gray without black and white actually existing. I'm going to show some of Mr. A's stories in just a moment, but I think it's worth noting that a lot of them can be a bit repetitive. Mr. A will frequently track down, fight, and intimidate a criminal or someone he views as evil. But many times, the antagonist ends up in a life-or-death situation thanks to his own mistakes, and Mr. A will simply stand by and let them die. It's not the most proactive thing for a hero to do, just stand by and let stuff happen. In other words, a superhero in an objectivist story is frequently quite passive because they have such black and white convictions. Superheroes are frequently selfless, ready to help others, but an objectivist is only responsible for his own success and is entitled to reap the rewards of their work. Let's take a look at another follower of objectivism who's worked on superheroes, director Zack Snyder. Critics of Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice point out that Superman does very little typical Superman stuff. It happens, but it never really seems to bring him joy. And just listen to his own parents tell him repeatedly that he really doesn't need to be using his powers to help others. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Just as this version of Superman doesn't feel obligated to help others, Mr. A may feel the need to oppose evil when he sees it, but that's for his own benefit. If he were to stand by and let evil happen, he would be betraying his own views. Here's audio of Steve Dicko describing, in his own words, Mr. A's outlook. Mr. A is based on Ayn Rand's theory of justice, on Aristotle's law of identity, his definition of man, and his view of art. Aristotle said that art is philosophically more important than history. History tells how men did act. Art shows how men could and should act. The perfect hero on principle says yes to a true identity and no to a contradictory one. Ruled by justice, he treats every identity as it deserves. He is the actualized potential for good in its purest form, a true moral measuring ruler. 
he is the most human and deserving of respect. Today's flawed superheroes are superior in physical strength, but common, average, ordinary in mental strength. Rich in superpowers, but bankrupt in reasoning powers. They are perfect in overcoming the flawed supervillains, saving the world, the universe, yet help us to solve their common, ordinary, average personal problems. It is like creating a perfectly physical adult with the reasoning limits of a six-year-old. In this early Mr. A story, a young criminal named Angel is extended some sympathy by a welfare worker named Miss Kinder. Ditko clearly has no sympathy for their work, as the office has signs reading, Don't think, feel, among others. Mr. A ruthlessly hunts down the teenager who has just stabbed Miss Kinder. Mr. A punches Angel atop a roof, and he clings to a flagpole. Miss Kinder tells Mr. A to save Angel, but Mr. A points out that in the time it takes him to save Angel, she could bleed to death. You don't want to die, but you're ashamed to say you want to live. Left to you, you'd make no decision. You'd rather let yourself die than admit your life is more important to you than the life of a killer. It's not fair to have to make that choice. Who should make it for you? Who should decide if you live or die? Everyone but you? But Angel, poor Angel, I, I failed him. I'm sorry, Angel, I'm sorry. You're cruel. You don't have any mercy or pity. I don't abuse my emotions. I have no mercy or compassion for aggressors, only for their victims, for the innocent. To have any sympathy for a killer is an insult to their victims. Even if you weren't hurt, I wouldn't have saved Angel. Mr. A lets Angel fall to his death. In the final Mr. A story, a husband and father commit suicide. Mr. A, as his civilian identity of Rex Grains, newspaper reporter, investigates and finds that his three partners in his real estate business pressured him into suicide. So Mr. A pretends to be a mercenary working for two of the partners to kill the third. This leads to the third man shooting his two partners, and then Mr. A shows up to reveal that he tricked him, and he's now a murderer. Mr. A leaves the man to kill himself. By objectivist standards, Mr. A is not a hypocrite, but rather someone who witnessed evil and stood up to it, at which point the evil man killed himself rather than face consequences. So now we understand how Steve Ditko lived by his objectivist views and inserted them into his work. Now it might help us to look back to the 60s when he walked away from Spider-Man. Spider-Man invented web shooters, but used them for altruistic purposes when, by objectivist standards, he should cash in on his amazing invention. Peter Parker sold his photos to the Daily Bugle paper for less than what they were worth, just to earn some money he was desperate for. Meanwhile, newspaper publisher J. Jonah Jameson, a self-made and successful industrialist, is frequently portrayed as a buffoon. But rather than compromise, Ditko walked away. In this fashion, he had what could be called a Howard Rourke compulsion. Howard Rourke was the protagonist of Ayn Rand's book, The Fountainhead. A brilliant architect, Rourke quit his prestigious job rather than make changes requested by a client. When the client has another architect implement their changes, Rourke actually blows the building up. Ditko would do work for others, but he would only give the effort he deemed worthy of what he was being compensated. Ditko came back to both DC and Marvel when there were different editors in charge, but some of his work was considered not up to his previous standards. He had a run on ROM Space Night in the 80s that received a lukewarm reception. He created Speedball at Marvel in 1988 and worked on it for almost a year, but his interest seemed to wane every issue. His last mainstream work was the co-creation of Squirrel Girl in 1992. Prior to that, he'd created Shade the Changing Man for DC in 1977. Character creation seemed to come more easily to Ditko than to many other artists, as almost every character he created for Marvel, Charlton, and DC is still in use today. But ultimately, Ditko was content to let Mr. A and some of his other creations speak to his ideology. A lot of these issues are still available to order online directly from Robin Snyder. It isn't as fun and cheery as Blue Beetle or Spider-Man or even Doctor Strange. But it is the best look at who Steve Ditko was, and many issues feature essays as well as long exposition from Mr. A or his supporting cast. 
In the second to last story with Mr. A, there's a long monologue by Mr. A's publisher boss after firing his brother and wife from the paper for printing stories that suited their ideals instead of his. Una, you and Henry get out of this building and stay out. But Bart, please listen. Whose paper is it? Who owns it? it it's yours, but... No buts. My policies rule my property. I decide on the uses and disposal of my earned property. If you and Henry want to promote your causes, earn, create your own paper. Now get out! Ditko was a creator unlike any other, and we're all better for the contributions he made to the field. It's unlikely that most people would agree with his objectivist standards, but you still have to admire how he lived by his own convictions. No one could ever accuse Steve Ditko of selling out. His artwork was beautiful and unique, unlike anything else. And I think that his contributions and his influence will outlast his life. Evil is powerless. A mind that refuses to accept or defend the truth, by that act, permits lies to exist, to give them respectability and influence, thereby undercutting and eventually destroying everything that is of real value. Destroyed not by the power of evil, but by the good's refusal to protect itself against an enemy that could exist only with good's permission. Alright folks, thank you so much for watching this episode, I really appreciate it. By the time this launches, I should either have just hit or be just about to hit 10,000 subscribers. So I really want to say a sincere thank you to all of you for watching, hitting like, and subscribe, commenting. It means a lot to me. It, it's really nice. Um, I'm not going to show any fan art this week. I'm going to hold it for next week because there was only uh, one piece and uh, that guy decided that he didn't want to be up for winning the uh, Gachapon Prize of the Week. But if you have fan art about this channel that you want to send, uh, send it to comictropes at gmail.com and I'll include everything I receive. Uh, thank you so much for watching and until next week, keep reading comics.